manipulate and get and bypass anti cheats and get control over the games process. After that, we are going to talk about different techniques I have tried uh, against different anti cheats and all the disadvantages that the each technique has and how we could mitigate all these problems. And finally, the results where I'm I'm going to be releasing all the code that I wrote during the research. Um, so it can be used like a good base to learn and get into this topic because it's sometimes it's really hard to uh, start debugging and uh, in reversing cheats. So first rule, if you are a gamer or, or you are have playing a game, you may know that the first rule is you don't cheat. Or if you are going to do it, try to not get caught. That's actually not what happened to this player from India, who which got caught in the middle of a tournament. He was, uh, this is the, the, the moment where the admin of the competition approached to his machine to take over of the keyboard and the mouse. But his, this player quickly tries to delete some files from the system. So those were the files he tried to delete. Uh, maybe he was writing a report, something uh, for a security uh, <laughs> engagement, but probably not, it's kind of suspicious. And if you pay attention to the location of the executable and also the icon, the it doesn't even have an icon, the executable. Um, when we talk about cheats, and especially in, in a competitive uh, scen a scenario where people is getting paid for playing these games, uh, it's really hard and details are a key factor if you want to get uh, uh, be un stay undetected and don't, un don't get cut. So the idea of that was to show you that this is a problem that actually affects a lot of companies, game developers, and it's also a professional uh, scenario where people are getting paid by this, and it's a real problem. So now let's talk about the first part of this talk is anti-cheats. Here you can see a lot of different logos or icons for multiple anti-cheats. Some of them belong to one particular game, but many of them can be used to uh, integrate with any game you want. Usually anti-cheat developers uh, bring an API so you can integrate properly with the game and defend all the features you want to protect from the game. Today we are going to talk about three of them especially the yellow one at the top on the first column is called BattleEye. The second one, the inspector, is a uh, sign called free. And the blue one is uh, easy anti-cheats. Those anti-cheats, you need to know that usually will have the same access level of an antivirus. They will have a driver running on a uh, ring zero, which will have full access to your system, file systems, and also all your processes. And this is quite interesting because if we take a look to the numbers and um, we put together all the monthly active users for all these anti-cheats, these four anti-cheats, we can see that it's quite a lot of people who is trusting this software, installing them in order to play a game. Um, to give you some real examples, here we have Battle Desert Online, which used the sign called Free, the, the Inspector one, as well as Linus 2 that you may know these two games have been on the market like quite a long time, more than 10 years. Then we have one of the last releases, Apex, together with Fortnite. They both use easy anti-cheat. And finally, we have a uh, player unknown Battlegrounds, which use BattleEye in order to protect the game. So now that we understand the different options we have, we need to see the main components that an anti-cheat may have or not. Some of them will be optional because they don't uh, implement all the components. And of course, the features that we are going to be talking about may uh, go from one component to the other, depending on how it's implemented. But first of all, we have a, a server, an anti-cheat server, which will be managing all the heartbeat connection with each agent that is running at the same time of the game. So if this heartbeat is disconnected in somehow because the process crashed, the, the service of the anti-cheat has been disconnected, it will automatically kill the game also so no one can play without the anti-cheat. And also we'll, start, uh, we'll be receiving all the alerts and reports for playing that have some malicious or uh, weird behavior on their PC. Then 
we are going to have like the most powerful part of an anti-cheat and it's the driver that they will be running in ring zero. This driver will give them a lot of power because they can use, uh, use it, for example, to register different kernel callbacks. So when a new event is is appear on the system, like for example, a process is created, they can get that event and execute some pre and post operations. And for example, if the process is trying to get a handle to the process of the game, uh, they will try to downgrade that handle or reject the access so another process are not able to manipulate the memory of the game. Uh, another thing they do is also control different flags in the kernel structure so they know if some kernel or user mode are debugging the, the, the system and also will manage all the protections to key services like ELSAS and CSRSS as we are going to see uh, later. Another feature will be a DLL, which will be running inside of the game, in the context of the game. Usually, uh, anti-cheats load a main DLL packet with VMProtect or what the packer you, you want. And then they start loading in unmapped region of memory with the strip headers, multiple DLLs with different modules that will take care of different functions and uh, will manage a, a specific task. So one of uh, some examples of those tax tasks are uh, control that any thread has been hijacked, uh, identify if uh, the import address table has been manipulated to hook some functions, some features of the game, inspect each region of memory, control that any executable uh, region has been created or new threads are being running on the context of the system. And then we will have the last part of the anti cheat that will be an external process running in, in ring three, which is going to be running at the same time also uh, that the game is running. This uh, process will usually brute force all the process uh, IDs, try to access to all the memory of each process, looking for malicious signatures, to uh, try to detect uh, well-known cheats, uh, and prevent from another uh, programs to access to the main game. Um, so now that we understand some of the main components from anti-cheat, we need to see the other part, which are the cheats. And if you have played a game and you, you know th that feeling when you see someone running across the map like full speed or always aiming in your head and you say, come on, what's going on here? There is something weird. So we need to understand what a cheat need to do in order to bring all these capabilities to a new user. And a way to classify a cheat could be depending on how it's integrated with the, the process, with the game process. One could be an internal one, which will be a DLL injected in the game. As you may know, there are multiple ways to inject the DLL. You can use a small shell code to load manually your DLL. And if you are doing this, things well and well prepared, it's really hard to detect when someone is inside and you have no, you have to scan the whole process trying to find if something is weird inside. Of course, it's going to be uh, quicker because we'll have, uh, be running, we will be running in the process context. And for the, on the other side, the external one will be uh, another process running at the same time, which will be constantly reading and writing memory from the game. Uh, this, of course, will make it uh, slower and easy to detect because the, the ways to access the process are well known in Windows and it's easier to maybe prevent this to, to happen. Another way of classifying cheats is because of their goal. Here we have some examples of aimbots which will usually assist the user to uh, aim better. So when a player is trying to shoot someone, he will uh, correct the aiming so it's always uh, pointing to the head of the enemy and will always aim a perfect shoot. This uh, kind of cheat usually will need to read and write the memory of the process because they will usually need to locate all the enemies, the, the array of uh, objects for the enemies, then locate the position in the game and do all the calculations they need in order to fix the aim in a 3D world. In order to fix the, the, the aim in the position of the crosshair, they will also need to write memory in order to fix 
the the offsets of the of the crosshair. Another example could be wall hacks or ESP, which is extra sensory perception. And these games usually will bring more information than the game does. For example, will reveal enemies behind the walls, modify the models of the enemies or are painted as red and you can clearly see, li uh, see them on the distance. And will also usually hook the graphic engine of a of the, oh the sorry the graphic engine in order to each time that the frame is being rendered on a game they can add all this additional information they need to the game. As an real example, here we have one case which got famous because he was uh, an streamer, well known streaming a streamer, which got caught because the anti cheat got reflected on his glasses. So he was streaming, the game appeared to be normal for all the people who was in the audience, but suddenly some of the people who was watching the stream started looking at his glasses and noticed that the model were being rendered as red and behind the walls. So this is a way to show you that this is a real thing that is happening and you could be got caught even if you are taking all the precautions to, to stay undetected, right? And finally, we have like the automatization and utility uh, cheats will bring you will bring you a bunch of different thing, things like leveling, like uh, teleporting, un unlimited health, whatever you can imagine. They will try to use it to bring you like uh, more features than the game does. So now that, that you all understand how these two things work, I want to explain you how I got here. Last year, with two friends from Immunity, we decided that we want to reverse a cheat. So we said, let's go for Linus 2. It's a game we played when we were younger. And we started like, looking on the market. And we went for a cheat developed in Russia from only one guy that has been in the market like 10 years, maybe, and was bypassing all the anti-cheats. So we found a free version on the internet. And we started like, digging and seeing what's going on. After some reversing, we saw that the anti-cheat was the sorry the cheat was injecting a DLL with a small shell code, which will load uh, the DLL inside of the game, and we'll have a command and control interface, which uh, was a third uh, process, an external process. There was some hidden communication between the DLL and the process, and of course all the binaries and the DLLs were. Encryptor, encrypted, uh, we're using VM protection, uh, well, also written in Delphi, which is awful to reverse. Um, once we, we got an idea of the cheat, we, we saw that he was using uh, name pipes in order to communicate between the command control interface and the DLL. Since we couldn't find any good tool to proxy this name pipe, we decided to go ahead, write our own proxy and we could hook and uh, start seeing all the messages that this uh, external uh, command, uh, command and control interface was sending to the DLL. And all what you can see here are the raw packages that were being written on the uh, name pipe. After some more reversing of the game, we saw that what actually was doing the, the cheat was hooking the main feature to send and receive packages on the game. So all that you see here are the raw messages that the game is taking, ciphering, and sending to the server. Once we got a, a real knowledge of the cheat, we decided to go for the new version. So we contact Daniel, our friend from Russia, and we bought the cheat, the last version. That's when we noticed some differences. We saw that he was not using name pipes anymore, and he was using file mapping. Um, okay, we found this interesting, but we didn't know why he was changing all these different things. So that's when we s decided to, or I decided to continue with uh, cheats, with anti-cheats. And I started looking at the market and how every anti-cheat works so I could understand why he was doing this kind of stuff. So the first, the first thing I noticed was uh, that there is a lot of m uh, money on the market. There's people, organizations making more than a million per year selling cheats for different games. Uh, there are private and public communities which uh, ask you for an interview in Discord or Skype in order to be if you are a trustful client and you're not going to reveal the cheat to the public. Um, they usually 
pre prevent or apply a lot of obfuscations to the cheats so you don't reverse it and you don't know how they are bypassing the anti-cheats. Um, I thought about all that market and I started thinking about what are game developers and anti-cheat developers doing in order to prevent all this stuff. So I, I, I took a look to the Apex numbers and I saw that they have claimed to ban that amount of people in the last month. This was two months ago, so now maybe the numbers are even higher. And it's okay, it's a huge number, but three weeks after Apex was released, for example, someone, what I believe is accidentally, disabled the heartbeat from the anti-cheat. So after that, people just renaming the executable of the game could bypass the whole anti-cheat at play without the anti-cheat even running. So it's quite curious that all this effort is being made to protect the games and then some mistake like this ha uh, happen. And actually, if we talk about uh, Xyncall 3, the, the inspector one, this uh, anti-cheat usually uh, load, the pro uh, load the process and protect it and apply all the protections while the anti-cheat is loading. And that gives you actually a quite frame, a time of, a frame of time where you can manipulate this process. And if you do that, you are inside of the game and if you're doing things well, no one will notice this. So something is uh, weird is going on. Um, I decided to go ahead and uh, start looking about the different techniques to bypass anti-cheats and see uh, and apply them on different ones to see where, where, uh, which one were the results. So uh, first, I start thinking about the goal. So if I want to bypass an anti-cheat, I will need to read write and allocate memory on the game, depending if it's internal or external. If it's internal, I could just allocate memory to write my shellcode and then load my DLL, but if I'm external, I will need to find a way to open a handle to the process and start reading and writing memory in order to get the information I need and also uh, manipulate the game so I can send actions, for example, to the game. And if I'm being internal, I will, to run, I will need to run this DLL in the context of the game. And of course, we need to be as stealth as possible, which means that we, try we need to delete all our traces, no create new handles, or so if the anti-cheat is uh, scanning each process on the system, we need to make sure that the anti-cheat doesn't detect our process manipulating the game. So first of all, I went and I started looking at hijacking techniques. Anti-cheats usually protect the game so any other processes can get a handle or if they get a handle this handle will have so low privilege that won't be able to read and write the memory of the game. But there are some exceptions like the ELSAS or CSRSS from Windows which if they don't have a handle to a process the system just crash. So this has been a problem for quite long time to anti-cheats until they discover that maybe downgrading the access to the handle, they could keep this handle from this uh, main f uh, these protected processes from Windows and maybe integrate with the system and control some of the stuff that's going on on that process. So imagine this scenario. We have ELSAS, which already has a handle to the process, which they, they need to allow this to happen. And we have the game, whatever game you want. And then we are going to have our external cheat. So the main idea will be to uh, stand inside of uh, ELSAS and uh, start reusing this handle in order to read and write the memory of the game. In order to send all the actions we want to our program or our DLL that is running inside of ELSAS, we will need some kind of hidden communication. So as Daniel did, we also tried name pipes. We went ahead and uh, start seeing how we could implement this and if you uh, the, 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 the thing that you see here is the how a handle how a handle for a name pipe is uh, usually seen on the system so by using this handle we inject it inside of ELSAS and we got our first bypass we bypass a thing called free for uh, black desert and this one was quite easy but after uh, analyzing what's going on. Here, for example, on the screenshot, you can see that on the ELSAS process, it has a handle to our name pipe, and on the console has all the actions that we were trying to implement on this uh, with this DLL inside of ELSAS. 
I develop this in a way that I send in a request, and this DLL execute each read or write uh, uh, action using different Windows API uh, the from user mode. So analyzing this, I saw that there were a lot of disadvantages on this method. And maybe that was why they moved and stopped using this technique. The first one is that we are creating a new handle on LSAS. So if the anti-cheat is analyzing this process, it's quite obvious that we are doing some kind of weird stuff inside of this process. The second one is that anti-cheats usually hook all the user mode win APIs so they can get all the control of the work uh, of the flow of the of the execution and if you are calling NT write virtual memory for example they are going to get that action sent into their driver analyze if this is an expected behavior or not and take actions against that the third issue is that if we are running a shell call or we are have injecting a DLL inside of Elsas there is going to be a new thread that is going to be running in an expected context, maybe in an unmapped region of memory, and that's something that is quite easy to detect. And finally, there is something that I already mentioned, is that uh, anti-cheats usually uh, downgrade all the handles. They do that by using the, the driver. They, uh, uh, they register pre and post operations, so when a new handle is created, they can analyze which privilege this handle is requesting and modifying them so, on it, so it doesn't have the, the required privilege to ma manipulate the process. The next step was to go and try uh, another different communication and this one was uh, using file mapping. So we stopped using uh, name pipes and we moved to file mapping. Why? Because uh, File mapping will allow us to have a shared memory between two processes, but without having a new handle. And how this is, pro is possible? Because if you read the documentation from Microsoft, you will see that when you create a file mapping, when you call this API, you are going to get a handle to the file mapping. But this uh, handle can be closed as long as you don't call and map your file. So if you keep the reference to the shared memory with and close the handle, you can keep using this uh, shared memory between two different processes. So the idea will be to create the shared memory, connect our cheat with the LSAS, and then close the handle in both ways. So with that, if the anti-cheat is analyzing all the handles from each process and also including LSAS, won't see any handle or any new handle. The way of doing that or manipulating the shared memory, uh, sorry, or using the shared memory will be to having an structure we, where we can send all the requests and responses that we need to our uh, program running inside of ELSAS. But the thing is, in order to prevent the race condition, we will need some kind of uh, spin logs or mutex. But all these features from Windows also requires handle. The way to about, uh, avoid having these new handles will be to manually use an spin log, for example, using the last byte from the shared memory to write one and zero and prevent a race condition. And one interesting thing is that we can do all these things before even the game is running. So we can create the shared memory, delete our, all our traces, and then when the game starts analyzing the processes, we they don't have uh, any idea what's going on because we have delayed all the execution of what has been done. So trying this, here we can see on the on the screenshot that the the cheat or the program I was using the external one, which has a name I don't know why I did I choose, but uh, <laughs> so we are that it's there it has no new handle to uh, the process to a shared memory. There is no evidence that this uh, program is communicating with another uh, program on the system, and of course in the console you can see all the actions that this DLL inside of Elsas is. Uh, doing and sending the responses back to our program. With this, we solve the first problem that we got that we had new handles when we try to create a shared memory. And also we don't have any share any handle to the game process with it, which is uh, quite important. Now the second problem we have is that usually cheats hook the all the user modes win APIs. Here we have an example of easy anti-cheats where they inject a DLL inside of Elsas 
and the main purpose of this DLL is to hook all the functions or the, the from Windows that are used to read and write memory of a process. For example, here is hooking NT read, write, and a log virtual memory. So when you call this uh, any of these uh, APIs, they will take control of what's going on and validate if you are doing something that is not expected. But if you take a look to the implementation of any of these calls uh, uh, in Windows, you will realize that it's quite simple. So maybe we could implement this by calling the syscalls directly so we don't use any API from user mode the Windows and any of those hooks will actually work for us if we are directly calling the syscall. So I go ahead, I implemented this with three lines of assembly and I start using a reading from ELSAS without uh, using any of the user mode win APIs, which was actually quite uh, practical to bypass all these hooks. So we have the second problem solved in this case. Now I want you to keep in mind these two problems because now I want, I want to show you a different technique that will help us to understand how we could bypass all these two problems. Hooking, right? When a game is trying to manipulate the, the, the information rendered by the game, it will usually, for example, rent uh, some function from the graphic engine like uh, DirectX and will do that in order to uh, be there each time that the frame is being rendered. So each time that something is going to be displayed or render is going to be uh, show, the cheat can be there adding information or manipulating the models of the different objects inside of the game. In order to do that, the usually ways to hook uh, one of these uh, functions could be uh, modifying the import address table or placing a jump in, uh, at the beginning of the function we want to hook. However, as anti-cheats knows that this is a, a well-known technique, they usually uh, start scanning all these functions that are usually hooked and also they validate that no one modifies the import address table. But anti-cheats need to bring some compatibility with external processes. For example, if you have played uh, any game that uses Steam, you may know that if you click like Shift Tab, the uh, Steam will display all the chats and your frame information inside of the game. And that's actually what uh, it's doing in order to display all this information, the same that a cheat will need to do in order to modify the rendering process of the game. Another example would be Open Broadcaster software, which is a software using for a streaming, which also will need to hook any of these DirectX functions or whatever is the graphic engine in order to get all the, the, the video from the game and redirect it to YouTube or Twitch. So taking that into account, I start analyzing these softwares and I saw that the main DLLs you injected into the process to create these hooks and uh, bring these uh, functionalities to the, the user were hooking the main feature from DirectX, which was the function present. Present is a function that is being called each time that the frame is being rendered inside of the game. So the way they were doing is they were placing a jump that was pointing to their module, their, their whitelisted DLL, so I start thinking about this and I start reversing the Steam DLL. And I thought, what would happen if I try to place my hook inside of the Steam DLL inside of instead of the game? Imagine that creating signatures for the game will be really easy because everything is on con under control of the game developers and the anti-cheat, but keeping all the changes that the, uh, the external programs are making every day or keeping each update it's quite hard work for anti-cheat company and also game developers. And maybe if you modify or manipulate this region of memory, it's, it won't be hard, uh, it, sorry, it will be hard to be detected. So after reversing the DLL, I saw, I found this uh, function, which was the function that they were using to replace the original present function from DirectX. Um, by doing that, I decided to go ahead and start reusing all these DLLs from third-party applications to put all my hooks inside of those applications. I actually, they didn't notice this. I could inject and render information inside of the different games without being detected. And if you 
uh, pay attention or a closer look to this DLL since they are un uh, no under control of the game developers and anti-cheat developers they always will have some different problems and in this case for example the uh, stream application you uh, have different code games and use name, mi uh, name pipes to redirect all the video from the game if you don't know what the code cave is it will be a portion of a, an executable memory region of memory which will be full of zeros and why this is interesting because maybe we could use this region full of zeros to place our shell codes or our code and then when we create a new thread or hijack an already existing thread inside of the game or LSAT we could actually run a thread inside of an expected context so we th this thread will be running inside of the region memory of a whitelist DLL with that we could use this uh, as long uh, sorry and we could also for example overwrite some portion of this DLL to inject all information there and hijack a thread this could be also applied to LSAS the overwriting some portions of uh, an external library uh, sorry another library from Windows we have to think that if we are manipul manipulating LSAS it's a process that which is really well known and even if we use a code cave or we use a, a DLL from Windows to overwrite some functions that are not being used this is quite easy or maybe it's possible that they detect us so we need to be very careful when we do this kind of stuff but however in order to uh, bypass the last problem we needed to move to kernel why because uh, we saw that the anti-cheat were using uh, the driver in order to downgrade in kernel mode all the handles we have even the LSAT handle so uh, cheaters also develop their own cheats or abuse from already existing cheats in order to run code in kernel mode and try to manipulate the system in order to bring or bypass the, pro the kernel protection from anti-cheats there are a few ways to uh, run code in kernel mode one could be enabled test mode but of course anti-cheats will validate the flags and if uh, the system is running in, in test mode they won't launch even the game and that's not a good way the second one could be signing your own drivers but this is a lot of money and also if they see which signature you are using to uh, sign your cheats and sell them this that's a dead end and the third option will be to abuse of an already existing driver that could be a CBE that is well known or also a zero day cheats nowadays are using a lot of zero days in order to low their code in kernel and prevent for being detected why because anti-cheats usually generate a list of blacklist uh, drivers and they use all this information to analyze all the cache, cache uh, uh, tables from kernel and check if any vulnerable driver or blacklisted driver has been loaded previously also and there is a four option uh, which will be uh, manipulating the kernel structures of the kernel loading our uh, unsigned driver and patching the kernel before patch war get us but this is kind of unstable and sometimes it's not the better the best approach so I went with this one the third one and analyzing the, the handles uh, already existing uh, existing in in Elsas here you have an example where easy anti chips downgrade the the handle for apex the process you are seeing on the blue line is the apex process and if you pay attention to the desired access you will know that this is much restricted than the rest of the processes usually uh, anti chips will remove all the flags that will allow to read write or uh, that the the access required to call windows apis that uh, manipulate memory of a process so the first idea was to uh, go for a vulnerable driver that will allow us to create a handle from kernel mode so i took a look to uh, synapse which is the driver for the racer mouse uh, have a cve from two years ago and I developed a, a small exploit to abuse from this driver and 
call uh, to set w open uh, process and get a handle from kernel mode by passing all the protections from user mode. The thing is that sometimes anti-cheat implement protections and when you call this handle from a uh, user mode and you try to use it, they will al also get you. This method didn't work very well with all the anti-cheats I was testing, so I decided to move further and try a different technique. The next thing uh, that I tried was to abuse from the gigabyte driver. Uh, there is a vulnerable version of this driver from one, uh, one year ago, which has a lot of vulnerabilities, but there are two which are really interesting. The first one will allow us to have a mem copy in ring zero and providing two virtual address being on kernel on user mode, it will allow us to map different buffers from one way to the other. So if we want to read some structure in kernel mode, we can map that structure if we know the virtual address and see it, uh, that information uh, on the user mode. And the second vulnerability will allow us to read and write arbitrary physical memory from the system. And this is quite interesting because by using this uh, vulnerability, we could start scanning all the physical memory looking for uh, useful information for us so we can uh, find uh, stuff or uh, usable uh, structures, kernel structures inside of the kernel memory. Uh, again, the vulnerability was that uh, uh, users without enough privilege are able to call and get a handle to the driver. So how does uh, usually this process work? The idea will be to perform a decom attack th that is a direct kernel object manipulation. And the main idea will be to look for the already existing handle that ELSAS has and, for example, upgrade the access from the handle. So if this handle has been uh, restricted when it was created, maybe we can later manipulate the handle and give process all access and have complete access to the memory of the process. In order to do that, the, the steps to implement this attack will be the following. Uh, first, we will get a handle to the vulnerable driver. And with this driver, we are going to start using the second vulnerability to read a uh, physical memory from the system. And we are going to start going all through the uh, memory, the, the physical memory of the system. By doing that, we are going to start looking for some interesting patterns. In this case, what we want to find is the ELSAS process. So here you have an example of a small uh, structure that will allow us to implement the, this required pattern. The first uh, attribute is going to be the image file name that for ELSAS is ELSAS.executable. And then the priority class will be two, which this number is always constant on ELSAS process. So by looking this structure in the physical memory, we are going to be able to allocate the e-process uh, uh, structure for ELSAS. Once we have this, b uh, this address for, uh, for this structure, we just need to calculate some offsets inside of e-process structure so we can get the pointer of object table, which this uh, pointer will uh, be pointing to the handle table. With handle table, we contain all the information of the handles that belong to that process. So now we are one step closer of finding our handle we need inside of the kernel memory. Then, in order to uh, resolve the specific address for a handle, we could use the exp lookup handle table entry. This function is implemented in n 2 as kernel executable, and if you take a look and reverse this executable, you will find that the things that you need in order to implement this function from user mode are to read and write physical memory and to mem copy virtual address on the system, and are the two things we already have. So the idea is to manually implement that. It's quite simple. And once we have this function, we are going to provide two parameters. The handle table that we already have, this pointer, and the number of the handle we want to get. By doing this, this function will return us the virtual address on kernel of this handle. 
And again, using the mem copy, we will be able to map this region of kernel memory into user. The, the only thing we have to do now is to overwrite the, the granted access and give, for example, processor access, and then map again that buffer to the kernel memory. Once we have done that, we can maybe upgrade the handle of the process. Here you have a screenshot where I'm mapping, if you can see, the access for one random handle inside of ELSAS, inside of the uh, user memory. This is the debugger from Visual Studio. So by doing that, I tried, I implemented all the, the exploits and the steps in order to do this. And luckily, I could bypass easy anti-cheat, which was other of the cheats, the anti-cheats I was uh, um, analyzing. And in this case, I could get access to all the region memories and manipulate the memories of the game Apex. This, you have to think that it's uh, quite interesting because if the anti-cheats knows about this, could maybe later try to analyze all the handles and detect if any of those of the interesting handles they, they are controlling has been modified. That's true, but also you have to think that since we are running uh, code in kernel mode and we could use any driver we want the, or maybe a zero day we have for this it's uh, we could maybe do another kind of crazy uh, stuff like finding the game actually directly from kernel and performing all the write and read actions directly from kernel and don't even have a handle in user mode so of course this option will be not so uh, stable so I decided to go for this option and try it and actually for battle eye this works but depending on what you're trying to do inside of the process, they maybe will give you a blue screen because they detect some weird behavior going on. So for BattleEye, probably the mapping directly the game of the process from kernel will be the best option. Um, with this, I could like delete all these problems. But if we think about this, we need to know that for blacklisting drivers, for anti-cheats, it's quite complex. They can't know, uh, they can't be aware of all the vulnerabilities that are around. They even can't know about the zero days that are being used. So they always will have these uh, disadvantages again, these kind of things. And as conclusions about all this process that we got in order to bypass all these problems that these techniques have, we get to know that always probably cheats and anti-cheats will end fighting on kernel mode, abusing from different drivers or zero days to load their code. That sometimes it could be trivial, like renaming a file or maybe uh, using uh, reusing a handle, as we saw with sign code free. But sometimes it will be quite more difficult and we will have to defeat different controls. And we need to know also that all these bypasses are partial bypasses. Why? Because being able to read and write memory of the game is not all what we need. We also need to be uh, stealth and undetected inside of the process. Because if we are already inside, but we manipulate a value of the game that the anti-cheat is also controlling, that will uh, trigger some alerts on the anti-cheat. But that's complete a different history because a story because you will need to co particularly analyze the anti-cheat for a game and see which flags from the game or which region of memory the anti-cheat is analyzing particularly for that game. And most important is that third, uh, the compatibility with Windows and third-party applications will always be a problem. Uh, manage all the changes that this application have in real time or are updating every week is really hard for anti-cheat developers. Um, we will probably use all these features they need to provide in order to abuse and get advantage uh, against all the controls they perform. And finally, as I mentioned at the beginning, I'm going to be releasing all the code because uh, starting to analyze anti-cheats or how they work usually take a lot of time. You will need first a lot of time creating cheats so you can know how to implement each uh, feature for a cheat. Then you will need to move and uh, start trying to reverse a program which actually is a rootkit which is going to be controlling everything inside of your computer and you can't even open a debugger. So when you start to uh, trying to do this kind of stuff, it's really hard if you don't have any information in on internet. And the information that you can find will be for people publishing on the on a forum that this is my technique, but uh, the entry level to get reversing this kind of software is kind of hard. So the idea will be to release all this code so you can use it as a template to learn and, and start learning about the different techniques and how an anti-cheat works and you can 
basically is has been developed in a way that you can just compile it and use it on any anti-cheat. And if you want to modify, for example, the exploit, it's everything prepared for that. So it will give you the capabilities to uh, start learning about anti-cheats. Uh, I think it should be already public on the GitHub. And uh, well, that was all. So thank you for being here. Uh, any question? Thanks. Don't know where is the mic for. Uh, thank you for the talk. It was really interesting. Um, Thanks. I think a lot of the techniques um, you mentioned in your talks, such as the gigabyte driver and referencing at exp handle lookup table had been previously publicly documented. Were there any helpful resources you used to help uh, do your development? Actually, if you pay attention to the techniques, are malware techniques. Usually, since you are fighting against a rootkit, you will need also to go so deep as the rootkit is working in kernel. Um, all this information, you can usually find it on forums or from cheater developers that usually publish some information but most of them just release like reuse of handle and then they stop talking because of course uh, anti cheat companies are there to reading even on the private and the private uh, communities where they sell the cheats they are there trying to buy cheats so they can reverse them and analyze them so i basically start like digging on these forums going hours and hours reading what they were talking about and then after that trying that by myself and being how i uh, test fail or succeed and and so on that was it. Thanks. So I think there is one. Hey, so you talked a lot about um, actually bypassing anti cheat. And I was wondering if you looked in or what your thoughts are on obfuscation of the actual game process or if anything made it difficult to actually write the cheats themselves. Yeah, actually, not only games are usually obfuscated, they usually have like Semida or VM Protect. Um, but uh, the, the thing is that by using all these techniques, sometimes you don't need to uh, worry about that if you are not developed the cheat. When you need to move and develop a cheat and start like providing different features, of course, you are going to be you will need to, re uh, to reverse the game and start analyzing how the memory of the game works. Anti-cheats also are usually uh, encrypted on also using VM Protect or any packer. So uh, uh, what I usually did is, for example, if they were using VM Protect on some stuff, they start dumping region of the memory to start analyzing that process once it has been loaded in memory. It's quite tough work, but you can go doing, you can uh, do it if it's possible. Hi, uh, thanks, great talk. I was just wondering, during your research, how did you like get around getting hardware banned and having to yeah, like, start off everything? Yeah, actually, I have another computer <laughs> which I use to all this stuff because uh, most of the, the, of the anti-cheats also perform hardware driver, a uh, hardware, uh, hardware ID bans. Uh, usually, the, the hardware ID are quite, are quite simple, and if you try to look for what the information they're trying to grab, like disk names, uh, uh, drivers, versions, all this information is usually easy to spoof. So if you want to like focus on a game or start analyzing a game, it probably you will need to reverse this hardware ban or, and create like a hook to money spoof all this information so that you don't get banned. But yeah, I use another computer, so my, my, my computer with, with the one I use don't get banned on, on everything. <laughs> Okay, so thank you everyone.